Good morning. As Labor's transport spokesperson, it's a pleasure for me to be with you today. And I want to thank Connor English for a tremendously enjoyable and stimulating presentation. Um, and I want to congratulate you all on um, the successful amalgamation of the old Aviation Industry Association and its export subsidiary into the new Aviation New Zealand. Um, I want to acknowledge your newly elected um, Chairman Graham Martin and Chief Executive Samantha Sharif. And I should be completely frank with you, even though I am the transport spokesperson for Labour, um, I am no expert on the aviation industry, far from it. The political debates on transport policy have tended to focus more on roads, public transport, walking and cycling, rail, ports and coastal shipping. And aviation has, for me at least, been flying somewhat under the radar. And one reason I was keen to accept your invitation to come along today was that I thought it would be a good opportunity for me to learn more about your industry. And I have to say, from the reading I've been doing, I'm very impressed by uh, the aspirations that you have and the plans you've laid already for your new organisation. I had no idea, and I suspect few New Zealanders uh, would know, that your industry uh, accounts for a, about $11 billion in economic activity and has a plan in place to increase that to $16 billion. Nor that you export to about 80 countries. And I was inspired to read of the many successes that the industry can claim. HNZ supplying services to Shell in the Philippines, CTC Aviation training pilots for a number of uh, major airlines, Spider Tracks, Track Plus, Flight Cell and Track Map all selling GPS, track and trace systems and communication systems internationally. And of course the success of BCS and Glidepath uh, with their baggage handling systems and the success that they've had in international markets. The New Horizons report that was commissioned by NZTE back in 2010 makes it clear that the industry has significant potential to grow its turnover and its revenue. The industry is innovative, relies on high levels of skill and specialisation and has significant export potential. And with those qualities, I think this industry is a great example of the kind of high value economy at the heart of Labour's vision for New Zealand. And I want, if I may, just to take, make a few comments <coughs> um, about the direction <coughs> of our uh, economic thinking. Labour's vision is for an economy that delivers more jobs and higher incomes. And to get that, we need to change a few things. We need to create an environment where businesses can flourish, where firms can grow and export, and with a bit of luck when they do, they will create the jobs, the good, skilled, secure, well-paid jobs that we desperately need. We want to shift the economy from volume to value. And many of you will have driven past the Wellington port on your way here this morning and seen a mountain of unprocessed logs. Why are we continuing to ship raw logs to China and Korea so that they can process them, add their intellectual property, <clears throat> make things out of them and sell them back to us at a profit? It's not a criticism of the companies who are doing that. It's an acknowledgement of our collective failure that after decades of economic policy making, we failed to create an environment um, where we have been able to break out of what is essentially a third world economic pattern of shipping large volumes of unprocessed raw materials offshore. And there's a link, of course, between an economy that focuses on shipping raw materials out and low skills and low wages. If you're exporting raw logs, you don't need an educated workforce to prune the trees cut the trees down and load them onto ships. What you want is lots of unskilled people competing 
to do that work as cheaply as possible. We want to shift capital into productive enterprise that produces the goods and services that the world wants to buy. We are never going to get rich as a country but simply by selling houses to each other. Which is why a capital gains tax that excludes the family home will not only take some of the speculative heat out of the market, in Auckland particularly, that is, a, that is as the Reserve Bank points out, a threat to the wider economy, but it will tilt also the playing field away from unproductive investment in residential real estate and towards businesses and jobs. We need to save more as a country so that we have the capital to invest in smart New Zealand companies. That's why we will make KiwiSaver universal. The Australians now, after 30 years of compulsory saving, have a $2 trillion superannuation industry. That's why they own half our economy. And if Norman Kirk's contributory superannuation scheme hadn't been canned in 1975, our country would now have a $240 billion investment fund. We need to invest more in research and development so that our firms are more innovative and invest more in skills and training so our workforce is more productive. Labor's monetary policy upgrade will remain grounded in con controlling inflation, but will require the Reserve Bank to pursue that objective in a way that assists us best to achieve an external surplus. And this, together with Universal KiwiSaver and a capital gains tax, will deliver lower interest rates good for businesses and good for homeowners. And it will make the dollar more competitive and less volatile, especially good for exporters. And because the government is the biggest purchaser of goods and services, we are going to give Kiwi firms first crack at government contracts. When the current government bought Kiwi Rail rolling stock at bargain basement prices from China, 90 good engineering jobs went down the road at Hillside. Now there's a gang of Chinese workers permanently stationed in New Zealand fixing the defects in those wagons. We need to take a more intelligent approach to, to government procurement that takes into account both the lifetime value of what's being purchased and the effect on local industry and jobs. It's all about building a higher value economy. Almost all the growth we currently see in the economy is coming from two sources. The insurance checks of the Canterbury rebuild and Chinese demand for milk powder. It's not what I would call a broad base for future prosperity. We need to export more. We haven't paid our way as a country for 40 years now and even in the midst of incredibly strong terms of trade, we've been continuing to run a current account deficit. We used to make things in this country, but most of those jobs got replaced by poorly paid, insecure service jobs. We can't turn the clock back, but we can adopt policies that will deliberately support Kiwi firms, Kiwi exports and Kiwi jobs. And I don't want you to think for a minute that I'm suggesting that the government can run your business for you. It's not about that. It's about trying to create an environment where your businesses can thrive. And none of this will amount to anything unless entrepreneurs, firms and industries seize the opportunities as you are talking about doing and are doing. As government, as policymakers, we want to set the, make sure that the rules of the game, the positions of the goalposts and the, and the uh, level playing field is there to make it as easy as possible for you to succeed. The country needs your industry to be successful. And for the reasons that I've outlined, we believe that as a country we must diversify both our exports and our export markets. We need firms that generate and sustain skilled, high-value jobs. 
and with the steps that you're taking to bring the industry together to promote a strong offering to global markets, to identify the pathways to growth and to speak with one voice on important matters of policy and regulation, you seem to be well on the way. I wish you well for the rest of the conference and if we're part of the next government and leading the next government, then I look forward to working with you from within government to assist. Thank you.